Today is uh, Monday, February the 6th, 2012. <clears throat> it's uh, early in the morning, or late at night, however you want to look at it. There's uh, the time up there. It's about five minutes to one. I'm out in the workshop. Uh, if any of you have ever seen any of my videos, you've seen multiples of uh, this shop. This is where I do just about all of my videos. I have several on my mind, but I was just tinkering tonight. I thought, well, I don't know, maybe this will be worth something and maybe it won't. If for no other reason I like to document this gorgeous old equipment that I have I've come by over the years and, and uh, learned to appreciate, I got a couple of uh, Tektronics, these type LC, type 130 LC meters. Got the calibration jig here for it too. I just went through the calibration on this one. Uh, the second one's over here. And uh, it calibrates just as well. These things are uh, 1959, 1960 era, I believe. They're just absolutely gorgeous instruments. I would take the skins off and show you, but um, take up a lot of time that might be worthless. Anyway, here is uh, here's something I was going to compare it to. Is this uh, General Radio 1650A bridge? Beautiful instrument. Um, I made a comment on one of my uh, you. YouTube video sometime back about how they rate this at one uh, percent all the way down to a Pico fair. Well, it's actually not true. Although it is, it it is an amazing instrument. Here's a good example. Here is a uh, 750 Pico fared cap, and you can see as I touch it how it's how sensitive it is, but it's stable. And uh, here, here's the multipliers. You might want to pick one of these up. If you get them cheap enough, then the uh, you know, why not? This is picofarads, micro micro. Here's milli microfarads, or nanofarads as we call it today, microfarads. And this is the multiplier. This is kind of the simplest way of looking at it. You multiply everything on the scale times 100, or here, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. You could look at it that way. One nanofarad. Anyway, you mul this is a, a scale multiplier. So here you put on a seven. Here I have a 750 picofarad capacitor. I'm actually driving it at the moment with an external oscillator right here. It has a, a, a one kilohertz oscillator. This actually, well, one of the questions this might answer is I've been uh, asking, I have seen on the internet where uh, questions come up about. Uh, capacitance and frequency. Well, capacitance and frequency are dependent in capacitive reactance, but the capacitor itself, the value of the capacitance, the, the value of the capacitor is not frequency dependent. Just like the value of inductance is not frequency dependent. Now, there are times where people will, especially in the older uh, book where people say we measured the inductance to be certain amount of inductance in micro Henry's at a certain frequency and the reason that they stated that is because <clears throat> it, it, it's like a milli ohm meter or a micro ohm meter it's, it's very difficult to measure things very 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 small or very very very, very large with you know the instruments that uh, we can afford and have on our desktop so um, if you want to measure a very small capacitor, say 10 picofarads, you need to measure it at a few kilohertz, maybe even a few hundred kilohertz. Actually, this one does quite a good job at uh, even 10 and 20 kilohertz. But if you try to measure it down at 100 hertz, then what you're ending up doing is it, it, it's kind of like taking this meter right here and trying to measure a milliohm. You, you just simply can't do it because it's it's just not in the scale. Anyway, what we'll, we'll actually measure it at different frequencies and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, for example, here I have set to external. Um, here is the external input. If we follow this thing up, it comes up to uh, this oscillator right here. Actually, this one right here that's running at uh, 10 kilohertz. 9.9 to .9 10 kilohertz. Here's our capacitor, and what we do is we crank up the sensitivity until we get a good display. Get this thing back far enough so you can see the whole thing. And then we turn, because uh, I've already got it set here so we don't have a lot of fumbling, 
but watch the meter see and then as it dips right there it's very very sharp dip we can read it off and it reads off about 700 and uh, 25 or so if I pull it off here not to keep the the video from going too long here if I put it over here this one actually measures it quite accurately. I know another gentleman uh, tried one of these. I'm not selling this this instrument. I have no stock in it whatsoever. But this one measures it quite uh, quite well. But anyway, back to the frequency thing. Let's change our frequency to instead of 10 kilohertz. Let's change it to 20. There's our 20 kilohertz. That's what we're feeding this instrument with right now, and we see that uh, that it's still it still dips at the same place. We can go to its internal one kilohertz. Remember, we're measuring 750 picofarads. Now, if we measure it at one kilohertz, we'll see what it does here. It's actually quite sharp, isn't it? There it is. Same thing. So capacitance is not frequency dependent. Capacitive reactance certainly is. And inductance is not frequency dependent. Inductive reactance is. But the, um, the frequency that we measure it at uh, as determined by our, the instruments that we use to measure this uh, this mixture of frequency and capacitance will matter as far as our accuracy goes on, um, on measuring very small and very uh, values of inductance and capacitance. Um, I will show you here once again here we're measuring this thing at 725 or so we take this thing off, take that, this little capacitor off, put it over here, and uh, zero this guy. Well, one thing about it, it's a piece of junk right here, and the power supply is a total piece of junk. But if we zero it, and then we hook it up, measures it at 700, I can get the glare off of it there. 721.9. Now I don't know if that's really that accurate, but it's 720. Same thing. Uh, this guy right up here measures it at just a hair over 720. Really nice instrument. Um, here's a spectrum analyzer I got not too long ago. I've been playing with. I'm driving it right now at about 460 or so megahertz. And here's its fundamental frequency. We can move it around right here. This is set at uh, 10 dB. And watch this. If we turn this thing, start turning this thing down, to say minus 10, minus 20. Then we start going out. Here we are at 470 megahertz. We start cranking this thing out. There's its uh, second harmonic right there. Out at 930 or so. Its third harmonic right there. And... Uh, and there is its fourth harmonic way out there. I'm a little bit off scale up here. Actually, I had this thing set right there a while ago, 460. I don't know if you can read that or not. And uh, you can uh, see the harmonics of this thing. Quite a nice instrument. This is a uh, 7L12. <clears throat> it only goes up to 1.8 gigahertz, but uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. One of the videos I plan on making very soon, and I, <clears throat> I'm open to suggestions if you have any comments on this, is what I was thinking about doing is using a program called P-Spice. P-Spice is a program I used for many years. Um, I started out working for NASA in 1970, was there for seven years, then I transferred out to White Sands Missile Range where I spent 20 more years. And during that time I had the opportunity to Work with lots of nice programs and one of them was P-Spice. Another one was that I learned to use was 
Derive. Derive, it's called Derive a Mathematical Assistant. There's others called Maple and Mathematica and whatever, but the only one that I could personally afford was Derive. Anyway, um, back in 1967 when I started to college, had somebody been able to show me how these things tied together, I think I would have been able to see it better in my head and maybe appreciate life or the engineering world a little bit better quicker, and that is with piece bias, we can model something simple like, say, um, an RC circuit, a differentiator. We can put a square wave in and we can see the differentiated output. And then with the uh, mathematical program like Derive or many others, we can uh, use a Fourier series of sine waves to create a, a square wave and then we can differentiate that mathematically. And then we can build the RC circuit and we can, we'll can we be able to see the square wave here on oscilloscope and then um, see the differentiated pulse. And they're all the same. It, goes, it, it, it would be, I think, a, a beautiful way to tie together the, um, the modeling programs we have today. Derive, or excuse me, P-Spice, as far as I know, is still, uh, the student version is still free on the internet. I don't know that, but the ones that I have are free. I got them some time ago, years ago, off the uh, internet. And from, uh, direct from, mm, I don't remember who made them then. I think Orcad owns it now. Anyway, and then the same with uh, Derive. I actually bought a copy of that. It's not that expensive. And then, of course, uh, building the circuit with an RC circuit and using, actually, this is an absolute marvelous old uh, vacuum tube square wave generator. It will generate a square wave with a rise time just over a nanosecond. So I've used it before with a TDR to uh, measure the impedance of cables to include twisted pair. And indeed you'll see that twisted pair, like in uh, Cat5, ends up being 100 ohms. If you terminate, if you have a variable terminator and you can, uh, you know, one that has a minimum amount of in capacitance and inductance to it, then um, you'll see that when you terminate it properly, then the, the, the reflected pulse goes away. So those are those are some things that uh, I want to do. But um, I know that um, many people, like myself, enjoy looking at YouTube videos and just seeing uh, basically the old instruments that still work so so darn well. Now back to this one. I've got one more last comment on this one. This thing right here is uh, here is a indeed a five picofarad capacitor. If I put it over here, you'll see five picofarad. If I put it up here, this, this has got a scale of full scale of three or 10, 30, 100, and 300. It's five picofarad, actually about 4.9 something. This instrument and this instrument will measure it. When I put it up here and I try to measure something that small, when you try to measure something as small as five picofarads, on this gorgeous old instrument, it, it basically is worthless. And I'll show you. I got it in 100, that's as low as it'll go. And I'll, let me show you where it nulls here. I crank this thing down. See that null right there? You can see it happening. And there it is. I mean, it works. Quite amazing. But when you read it off, it's a little bit inaccurate. I guess with all due respect to this to this uh, era and, and, and uh, gorgeous instrument, it measures a little bit over six. See, but that's as small as it go. You're, you're down here like just a hair away from zero. So this is probably not a recommended instrument, in my opinion, for measuring very small capacitors. Actually, it's not doing too bad, is it? Maybe, maybe I need to give it a little slack here. It measures it at about 6.5. So it's off a hair or two. I think they... Uh, but they, they uh, say in the book, here's the book right here, this is a copy of it, but they uh, say plus or minus one picofarad. Well, I guess maybe it is. Anyway, 
uh, to measure the smallest ones. This one and this one actually do a better job than uh, than this gorgeous old instrument. So anyway, this is I got some test jigs here for this that I uh, I intend to uh, use and and show in some other videos too. I like to document this stuff because. Um, one of these days I'm going to be so old that I, I'm not going to be able to do it. And these instruments and I both are going to quit working, but, but not tonight. <laughs>